All right, we're ready for 2 Timothy chapter 2 in our survey and uh, chapter 3 for next week. And you should have had received questions. If not, they're on the front pew, and you can get those after class. Let's review where we've been. We've only covered one chapter in this book, and so we introduced 2 Timothy last week, gave some introductory information, and covered chapter 1. So chapter 1 is about be not ashamed. Uh, Paul talks about don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, that is the gospel, or of me, his prisoner. Um, why would Paul need to t write to Timothy and encourage him not to be ashamed? We all need that exhortation, but Timothy, we gave some indication last week, probably needed a good dose of this. Finish my sentence. Timothy seemed to be just a little bit timid. Uh, verse 6 and 7, uh, God has not given us, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We take it because of the exhortation given in chapter 1, chapter 2 as well, that maybe Timothy was a little bit timid and a little bit shy, and maybe the uh, imprisonment of Paul had discouraged him a little bit, maybe of being so bold as Paul had been. And so there is need for exhortation to not be ashamed of the testimony of the gospel or of Paul, his prisoner. Now then, we're ready for chapter 2, and here is our outline that we're following of the book, only four chapters, be not ashamed, but call chapter 2 a workman, chapter 3 perilous times, and then continue to preach the word chapter 4. So we're talking about this workman of chapter 2. Let's be a little more specific now. Uh, this is a workman who has these following characteristics. Timothy, if you are if I might paraphrase in one sentence, chapter two, if you are a workman, there is no reason to be ashamed. And so the key verse, I've tried to give key verses for our will for each one of these chapters. We gave verse eight, if you were not here last week, it's kind of a key verse that summarizes that whole chapter. Chapter one would be verse eight. Chapter two would be verse 15. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. We'll come to verse 15 a little bit later. But concerning this workman, he needs to be strong. He needs to be willing to suffer. He needs to be a workman. He needs to be pure, and he needs to be a good servant. And so if you are a good servant, you're pure, you're working, and you're willing to suffer, and you're strong, Timothy, you are a workman that does not need, have any reason to be ashamed. Now, let's get ahead of ourselves to verse 15, a workman that does not need to be ashamed. Put this, let's, let's remove that concept away from preaching and from spiritual and think about your job. You've been hired, if you don't have a job, picture that you do. You've been hired to do a job, whatever the job may be, and what would it be, what would you have to do so that you're not ashamed of the work that you do? I don't mean that you're ashamed because it's a lowly task. I don't care what it is. Let's say you're doing office work and you've been asked to keep all these files updating you, to type all of this up, uh, et cetera, uh, answer the phone, what would give you a reason that you have no reason to be ashamed of the work you've done? When you're doing the best you can, somebody else? Okay, yeah, do, do, doing the best you can. When you're doing the job that you've been assigned, doing it with the greatest ability that you have, there is no reason to be ashamed. Now, why would you ever have a reason to be ashamed? If you're not doing your job, you're not keeping up, you're not doing the things that were assigned to you, you're told to answer the phone, the phone rings, you never answer it, you're told to type up these letters and none of them get typed, you have every reason to be ashamed. So Timothy, when you're doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, you have no reason to be ashamed. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 2. So <clears throat> let's start with being strong. <clears throat> in verse 1, he says, you therefore my son, be strong. Now, we'll finish that phrase in just a moment, but you, therefore, suggest there is a connection to chapter 1. Chapter 1, don't be ashamed. Here are some who are ashamed. Here are some who are not ashamed. In view of that principle of the value of not being ashamed, you, therefore, need to be strong. So I think the idea of being strong is parallel to not being ashamed. Be strong, Timothy. Uh, be strong in the Lord. The strength is, uh, comes from relying upon the Lord 
and be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that is relying on the help that comes through Christ. I think that's parallel to chapter 1, 7 and 8, where he talked about God gave us the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. And then he talked about the power, verse 8, of the Lord, resting and putting your full confidence in the Lord. Uh, the same Lord that raised his son from the dead and delivered the gospel is the same one that will help you through these trials and these, these persecutions or whatever else that you may face. All right. <clears throat> So verse 1 simply says, be strong. Now, let's talk about the areas in which he needs to be strong. And uh, four areas that he talks about here. First of all, be strong as a teacher. Now look at verse 2. These things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. What are you learning from verse 2? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, we learned several things here. Uh, one is I learned the qualifications to preach. Do you not? The qualifications to teach Bible class. Do you not? What are the qualifications? They're basically two. Everything else, you uh, buy a book that's been put out on preachers and their qualifications. You may find somebody that lists 10 different qualifications. Somebody's got eight. Somebody's got 15. But they all can be summarized under two found here in this text. What are they? Faithful, faithful to the Lord, number one. And secondly, able to teach. If he's able to communicate, able to teach, that may have to do with knowledge. That may have to do with the ability to communicate that knowledge. But able to teach, but also he has to be, or she has to be faithful to the Lord. Those two qualifications. Let's go to question number one. We'll come back to the flow of the text in a moment. Who is included in the word men, verse two? All right, faithful men. All right, that's good. Mankind. I would use this verse to justify having women teachers in Bible classes. Why would I do that? Because in the original, there is a word that means males only. We saw that in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. I would that men pray everywhere. That's the word aner, meaning males only. Talking about men leading in prayer. But this is a word, anthropos, which has to, with uh, Thayer says it means with reference to sex, that is male or female, uh, contextually, we determine by the context. So sometimes this word is used and it means males because of the context. Sometimes it refers to mankind. So it, it, it means mankind, it doesn't mean males only. So the things that you have heard, you teach it to mankind who shall be able to teach others also. Women can and should teach. Old women teach the younger women, Titus 2. Remember that? Uh, Other passages. So I would use that passage, and it has been used effectively in discussions. But I also learned a principle about spread of the gospel. Here's how the gospel spreads. It really doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a a lot of uh, uh, committee meetings. It doesn't take a lot of uh, classes. Here's how you go about it. Here's how it works. You teach someone else who then teaches someone else who then teaches someone else who then teaches someone else or if you teach two, those two then teach and then the gospel spreads through the whole world. That's how the gospel spreads. And so someone says, teach us how we can spread the gospel to the whole world. Just teach your neighbor. And then if they learn the gospel, they will teach their neighbor. And most likely if you teach two, then each one of those that you teach, you're going to teach two and then starts multiplying until we've covered the whole world. That could be done in a short order. All right, let's go back to the flow of the text, uh, though. <clears throat> what Paul is telling Timothy in verse 2, be strong, be courageous, don't be ashamed, have confidence, have boldness, and do that as a teacher. You take the things that you've learned, and you teach it to others, and then they're going to teach either, even others. So keep in mind, Timothy, your boldness is going to help with the spread of the gospel. Does that make sense? All right, here's the second point about boldness. Be bold as a soldier, verses 3 and 4. What's his point here? And then we'll get the details. How, how would you summarize his point? Be strong like a soldier. All right? Be committed. Be dedicated. What else? Focus. Uh, un, un, uh, bothered by the distractions of the world. Three things I list here. First of all, You have to, as a soldier, endure hardships. What does that mean? 
literally as a soldier. Forget about spiritual. Um, those of you, uh, Tim, you've been in the military. What's it mean to endure hardness as a soldier? You've been a soldier. What's that mean? Okay, react to this since you've been in the military. React to this. It's not my thought, but if, if someone said it's all a piece of cake, it's just a piece of cake being a soldier. It's all just a bunch of fun. You get paid a lot of money to be, be a soldier. React. No, you've got hardships. What do you mean hardships? Yes. And so <clears throat> picture people who sign up for the military because they like the, mili the package, the, the retirement they're going to get, et cetera, and then they suddenly get called out to the front lines. What do you say to that person when they said, I want to be a soldier, and they get called up to the front lines? Signed you signed up for it. This is part of the job. This is part of the job. It is not all a piece of cake. It's not all fun. It's not all about pay. It's not all about the retirement. It's a... It, it, you have to be enduring hardships to be a soldier. Timothy, you signed up as a soldier in the army of the Lord. So that means there are some hardships you're going to have to face. Yeah, you're going to get shot at a few times. And yes, it's not all a cakewalk. So endure hardships as a soldier. Verse 4, do not entangle yourself into the world. What, um, let's get the wording of that. No one who's, who's engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life. What does that mean? All right. All right, that's good. All right. Abs absolutely. Barnes suggests it was always a condition of a good soldier that he must give up his business during the enlistment and devote himself to the service of his country. The farmer leaves his plow, the merchant his store, and the lawyer his briefs. Uh, the Roman soldier was not allowed to marry or engage in any husbandry or trade, and uh, they were forbidden to act as tutors to any person. In other words, his whole focus needs to be on being a soldier. So if you had someone fighting for your freedom, and he's there fighting the enemy, you want him thinking about, uh, uh, I'm on my phone here, I'm trying to see, if I'm running the business back home, and I'm trying to see if everything's going to balance here, and Oh, wait a minute, here comes an enemy. I don't want him focused on his business. I want him focused on the task at hand. Does that make sense? Now, as uh, one writer observed, that doesn't mean that he can't engage in something besides merely preaching because Paul himself was a tent maker. But his focus is to primarily be on the preaching of the gospel if he's, if he's a servant of the Lord. Make sense? So don't be entangled in the affairs uh, of the world. Um, I'm sorry? Absolutely. It was Lipscomb who said it's not a soldier's employment that is forbidden, but the entanglement with it. I like that quotation. Verse 4. Uh, at the end of verse 4, but his focus is to be what? Yeah. Pleasing the one who enlisted him as a soldier. In this case, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, uh, all you're interested in is pleasing the Lord. I'll tell you some of the best advice I ever got. I, got, I reached a point one time I was ready to throw up my hands and quit as a preacher. And Connie Adams had me sitting across from his desk and he looked over, if you know Connie, he looks over those glasses and he said, let me tell you something. He said, you're not serving anybody but the Lord. You understand? <laughs> I understood. You're not serving anybody but the Lord. And if you please the Lord, it doesn't matter what anybody else may think. Your soul is not for sale. All right, let's move further to verse 5. What's the point of verse 5? All right, they compete to win. And so be strong like an athlete. If an athlete's going to engage in athletics and the games of the Grecian games of field and track, he must play by the rules. Now that's interesting to me. 
uh, that he words that according to the rules, that while even under severe persecution and tempted to back away, you still have rules to play by. Do, do you see people that sometimes think under the pressure, under the moment, the rules are cast aside? The rules don't apply because of the pressure at the moment. Paul is telling Timothy, I'm in prison. You may be too if you preach, but just like an athlete still has to play by the rules, you've got to play by the rules, even under pressure. And so be strong like an athlete. All right, then there's another illustration given in verses 6 and 7. And what's that illustration? That of a farmer. Ah, the hardworking farmer must first partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So what's the point about a farmer? Yeah. Yeah, you don't get your rest yet. Uh, it, one who's timid and shy wants the peace and the tranquility now instead of the combat or the conflict. And Paul, I think, is telling Timothy, the farmer has to wait for his crop. He plants, and he doesn't eat up, up at, at the front. He doesn't eat till later. Uh, he doesn't gain the harvest, at, but he has to wait patiently. And you have to wait patiently for your peace and tranquility. Uh, be bold, be strong, uh, et cetera. Questions or comments through verse 7? Yes, ma'am. Good point, good point, very good. Be strong like a teacher, be strong as a soldier, be strong like an athlete, be strong like a farmer. You need strength, Timothy. Don't be timid, don't be shy, don't be ashamed. Questions or comments on one to seven? I'm, I think that verse seven, probably some think it refers to the verses following. I think it probably refers to those that are ahead. That is before, consider what I say. In other words, consider all these points that I've just made and may the Lord give you understanding um, in all things that may you come to an understanding um, and be strong. May, when you consider the farmer, when you consider the athlete, when you consider the soldier, uh, when you consider your job of teaching, uh, may you be strong. Questions or comments? All right, let's go to the next section. Let's go to question number two, three. Why was Paul suffering in prison at this time? Give a verse in this chapter. Absolutely. He's preaching the gospel, and particularly he's preaching the resurrection. That was the thing that upset him, was the resurrection from the dead. And that's why he's in prison the first time. And no doubt that has everything to do with that now. <clears throat> um, and he mentions that in verses 8 and verses 9. For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even... Uh, in chains. Question number four, was Paul feeling sorry for himself while he was in prison? How do you know? All right. Okay, that's exactly. I endure. Notice that at uh, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. He wasn't feeling sorry for himself, um, but rather he was using it as an opportunity to continue to preach. Now, let's look at verses 8 through um, 13. I can't keep up with my remote this morning. I don't know what I did with it. Uh, here we go. Um, let's look at 8 through 13. Three things happen here. He said, I'm suffering for the preaching of the resurrection of Christ. Now, let's get to that point in verses 8 and 9. Remember, here's something to keep in mind. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Um, think about the resurrection. Think about the hope that it brings. Uh, think about the, the power that's involved. Now, there's a number of things I think implied. If you think about the resurrection, you think about the salvation comes through that, and therefore you'll keep preaching and be bold. Um, you'll be a workman. Uh, Perhaps alluding to the principle mentioned in chapter 1, you think about the power of the resurrection, the same power that raised Jesus is the same power that will help you through this. Um, 
But I think his point is more be willing to suffer for the cause. Uh, for, look at verse 9, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. In other words, I'm in chains and I am bound. I am imprisonment because of my preaching of the resurrection um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at the end of verse 9, but the word of God is not chained. What does that mean? Yeah. The fact they put him in prison didn't keep him from preaching. In fact, he's writing prison epistles in the first imprisonment. He's writing this one in his second imprisonment. He was able to preach to some in the palace. Remember that? Uh, preach before King Agrippa in that first imprisonment. Um, and Felix. So he, uh, he said it, it fell out. Philippians 1 says it fell out to the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, he said this didn't shut down the gospel, but it fanned the flames of the gospel. So they can put me in chains, but they can't control and confine the word of God. It's still being. So I think what, what's his point? To, what's Timothy to take away from that, I guess, is what I need to ask. When Timothy sees this point, you're in prison because of, you're confined because of preaching Christ, but the gospel wasn't confined. Timothy's to take away from that what? He can preach under any circumstance. He can preach under any circumstance? He can still preach it, but even if Timothy faces imprisonment, the, 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 the effect of the gospel is not being stopped and keep preaching. Say again. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid. Now look at verse 10. Now, Paul is saying, suffer for the sake of saving souls. He said, therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. What's that saying? Paul had just said, I'm suffering for the cause of Christ, but I'm willing to endure it. Why? That's what he's telling us in verse 10. Which is? Saving souls, yeah. That when we preach the gospel, we're saving souls. So be willing to endure. Timothy, don't be timid, don't be shy, be strong. That's the point being made, be strong. And don't be ashamed, but be a workman. And uh, that, I, that I'm preaching that the salvation may be obtained in Christ. We had a question, question number five. Where is salvation and how does one get there? Salvation is in Christ. How do we get in Christ? Yeah, if salvation is in Christ, Paul says you are baptized into Christ, right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. All right, now let's get verses 11 to 13. There's some controversy over 11 to 13. I don't mean major controversy, but exactly what is being quoted here. This is set off as a quotation. It doesn't seem to be a quotation from any Old Testament reference. Some think that it may be the lines of an ancient song. Um, but, and then that's one question. And I, it probably, I'll just give it, it's an ancient song. I don't know where it came from. Paul just quotes it. Um, the other thing is, what exactly is he referring to? And I think we can put it in context. Um, and that is, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. There's the question. Is he talking about if we die with him in repentance? Some think. We'll live with him, or if we die with him physically, we'll live with him. Um, I don't think he's talking about dying spiritually, separated from God. So what's he talking about? I think as per the context where there's this timidity and fear that what Paul is saying makes sense to me, that this is a true saying, that if we died with him, we shall also live with him. In other words, if, if you end up facing death, uh, and I face death because of that, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. So don't, don't let the pressures get you down. But on the other hand, if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful and cannot deny himself. Notice the contrast, uh, the beautiful contrast between man's lack of faithfulness at times and God's faithfulness no matter what. Even when we're unfaithful, God is still faithful. So what's the point of 11 to 13? I think his point is uh, be willing to suffer. Endure, endure hardship, be willing to suffer. Uh, and through that, we gain victory. When, if we die with him, we'll live. And so we're going to gain victory through that suffering. So Timothy, don't be timid, don't be shy. Uh, shoot for gaining that victory. Now let's go to 14 to 19. 
And let's see what this is about. Be a workman. This gets to the heart of the chapter. Uh, be a workman. Now, we've already seen multiple times in Timothy, 1 Timothy, that is, about being uh, not um, wasting your time with things that were absolutely useless. Let's get to that verse 14. Uh, don't strive about words. Let's get to the verse, and then we'll see what it means. Remind them, that is, those you teach, these things charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. What's that about? I think in application it would apply to anything that is does not pr promote godliness and does not promote uh, an understanding of the revealed will. Um, I made this, report, uh, made this point repeatedly here that uh, in talking to younger men about preaching, I tell them constantly, don't waste time on useless material. Don't waste your time in the pulpit, in the Bible class, uh, spending 10 to 15 minutes, and when you get through, you wrap that all up and you've got, you accomplish nothing. There's nothing to it. It didn't accomplish a thing. Nobody's edified, nobody learned a thing, but we, it was entertaining. It was an interesting story. It was a funny thing to tell or whatever. Don't waste time on useless material. But striving about words to no profit, perhaps the things we saw in 1 Timothy chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1 as well about um, the things that have to do with fables and endless genealogies, verse 4, verse 5, uh, that similar kind of thought, uh, but charge them if you're going to be a workman, a workman that has every reason to be ashamed if he's spending time on controversial things that amount to nothing. He's not saying don't contend for the faith. That's not his point. But his point is wasting time on things that are of no profit that's to the ruin of the hearers. Now verse 15, be diligent. Your King James, if you're using the King James, say may study to, to show yourself approved unto God. The word really and literally means the idea of being diligent. Be a diligent, dedicated worker to present yourself as approved unto God, then you're a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So be diligent, uh, put forth an effort, uh, more than just reading and studying in every area of your service, be diligent. Now at verse 15, what does it mean to rightly handle or rightly divide the word of truth? Question number six, what does that mean? All right, I, I, good point. Quite often hear people talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, you gotta divide the old from the New Testament, and that's true, but that's not even the point under consideration. It means handling it properly, uh, handling it right, handling it with care. And a workman that has no reason to be ashamed is one who takes the word of God and he handles it properly. He takes the text, he puts it in context, he makes application of the text, rather than abusing the text, um, or rather using it to flavor. Uh, there are some preachers that take the scriptures and they flavor their message with scripture, but their message is really their own, their own thinking. It's a promotion of self, or maybe it's, it's an agenda he has, but he flavors it with a little scripture so it has the flavor and the taste of scripture, but he's not really preaching the scripture at all. Make sense? So he's misusing the scriptures. He's mishandling the scriptures. Now I take verse 14 and verse 15 to be in contrast. That here are those who, for example, strive about words to no profit are mishandling the scriptures. But you, Timothy, be the kind of workman that handles the scriptures aright. Uh, you use it with skill. You, uh, you make proper application. You put passages in their context. Um, you preach the whole counsel of God, not... You're mishandling it if you only preach the positive and not preach the negative, etc. Now verse 16, which tells me that we're going back to the thought of verse 14, but shun and uh, profane and vain babblings which will preach to more ungodliness. What's that about? In fact, your footnote will say empty, in the New King James at least, empty chatter. What does that mean? 
Chatter is a lot of talking, and empty means doesn't mean anything. Uh, just because someone can talk for an hour, throw a few scriptures out, does that mean he said anything? Does that mean he said a thing? It may, it may amount to nothing. may have not have taught a thing, may not have exhorted you, may not have encouraged you. It's still a lot of empty chatter. Uh, but shun profane and vain babbling or empty chatter, that just increases to more ungodliness, and that's because the truth is not taught. Now, he mentions a case in point verse 17, and that is the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus. They are fitting into that category. What did they teach? Verse 18. A resurrection had already taken place. What does that refer to? I don't know for sure. In some shape, form, or fashion, they taught a doctrine that said the resurrection is past. Some thought that that means that uh, those, they think maybe those who had died have already been resurrected to eternal life. And so the resurrection is past for some. There's not a resurrection in the future for them. Maybe for us, but not for them because they've already been resurrected. Some think they were arguing for some kind of spiritual resurrection and that there is no bodily resurrection in the end of time, but it's a spiritual resurrection, and that's already taken place. I'm not sure what they were saying, but I know this, that there is a resurrection taught in the future, 1 Corinthians 15, and they said it's already passed. That means they were wrong. So it's error. And that uh, verse 15, or verse 16, just increases to more ungodliness. Um, the danger of that is what, verse 18? I mean, what's the big deal? They, they say the resurrection is past. We know it hadn't, but let them teach it. And if people believe that they can't change the resurrection, what happens? They're teaching something. Yeah, what's the wording here? You're right. Overthrow the faith of some. It overthrows the faith. It debunks their faith. Uh, that happens with a number of things. For example, uh, some of the teaching on Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 1 to 12 being kind of a myth are not true history you teach that to your young people and that will overthrow their faith they, they will have no confidence in genesis 1 and 2 in the creation account or in the god that wrote it all right now verse 19 let's get that quickly in contrast to that the foundation of god stands sure having this seal and what is this seal that's a legal inscription but what's the in other words it's assurance what is the assurance we have Absolutely. God knows those that are his. What does that mean to us or to Timothy? Yes, absolutely. The Lord never loses sight of his own, so the faithful have no reason to be shaken or be disturbed or discouraged. Timothy, don't be discouraged. Uh, there are those teaching empty chatter, and you keep fighting against that. You hold to the truth, and the Lord will know those that are, if you're his, the Lord knows who you are, and the Lord will keep that in mind, and the Lord will take care of that. And that ought to encourage the man or the woman who is discouraged. Now, let's talk about being pure 19 to 22. Um, as we get to uh, work through this, look at the end of verse 22, part B of verse 22. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In other words, that's I'm sorry? Is that verse 19? That's verse 19, yes. Okay. Yes. In other words, stay pure. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now, he gives an illustration here at verse 20. What's his point? In, every, in a great house, there are vessels of gold and silver, one of silver, and, uh, uh, wood and of clay, and some of honor and dishonor. And uh, if you cleanse yourself, uh, you're a vessel of honor. I think his point is there are men like Hymenaeus and Philetus, they are vessels of dishonor. But you, Timothy, make sure you are a vessel unto honor. And so in order to do that, what you need to do, verse 20, uh, 19, is depart from iniquity. Purge yourself 
uh, of the, the sin. Now, look at verse 21. If anyone cleanses himself of the latter, he is a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. In other words, his point is that if you become a vessel of honor, you're of use and you're a purpose in the Lord's kingdom. Now, let's get ahead to verse 22. Uh, I'm convinced we sometimes lift that out of context. And that is flee youthful lust. I don't think we misapply it. I just think we apply it usually to sensual lust. We tell folks, flee youthful lust. There are, there are temptations and lust peculiar to youth, and so you need to run from it. That's true. That is a youthful lust. Flee from it. The text says so. Let's put it back in its context. Probably here it refers, maybe, to... Y'all don't know any more than I do, do you? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking it probably refers to the, t uh, the temptation toward pride or toward being timid, uh, toward um, fear, I guess is the word I'm looking for, as per the context. Where Timothy, uh, where Paul is, is older, Paul is aged, Paul has been around the block and perhaps he's developed this boldness to the point it's old hat for him, but Timothy's just learning some of this. Uh, maybe that's what fits into the context. Maybe it includes other things, and I think it would, but it seems in the context he may be talking about live a pure life and, and avoid and run away as far as you can from the youthful temptations. Uh, maybe that timidity and that fear. Then he talks about following after purity. Look at verse 22. I'm wanting to get to, to some other points here. Our time is running out. Look at verse 22. Pursue righteousness, faith, and love uh, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In other words, when you run from something, you run towards something else. So if you run from sin, run toward righteousness and godly living. Now, the rest of the chapter has to do with being a good servant. So let's see what he says in this, this context. Um, goes back to this point of avoiding disputes and quarreling. Look at verse 24. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. And so here's foolish and unlearned questions. Uh, American Standard just says questionings. Uh, they gender strife. Um, things that amount to nothing. That when you get through and you've argued over it and you settle it, you still haven't accomplished anything. We've talked about that already. Now let's get to verse 24. A servant must not quarrel, but be what? Kind to all, gentle to all, able to teach, patient. So Timothy, if you're a good servant, you're going to avoid the disputes and quarreling. You're going to be gentle and you're dealing with people. You're going to be able to teach and you're going to be patient. What does patience have to do with being a good teacher, preacher? Absolutely. One of the most frustrating things is trying to teach somebody something that you think is as clear as a bell and they're just totally confused. And so you can get frustrated and drive them further away or you can methodically back up and work through that somehow where you can, your point is to teach them the truth, not to win the argument over them. Uh, now verse 25 and 26, let's talk about uh, this humility. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition. What does that mean? Be gentle in your teaching. Don't lord over your knowledge. That's good. There is going to be opposition, Timothy. But as you deal with those people, deal with them with a dose of humility. You're going to deal with them with a, a dose of humility. And here's why. Here's why. Verse 25 at the end. We're hoping maybe, just maybe, come to their senses. Yes. Say again, that they will repent, absolutely. The, yes, that they may repent and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Um, we don't have time to develop that thought of being taken captive by Satan to do his will, but that's, that'd be an interesting study within itself. All right, so that's what 2 Timothy chapter 2 is about. Be a workman, has no reason to be ashamed. Next week, we're going to deal with perilous times. There's a lot in that chapter, perilous times. 
that Timothy has to face.